Hi everyone, this is a follow-up on my battery restoration video where I tried to desulfate this battery and recover it. Now, I haven't actually released the original video yet, so I don't know what the comments will be, but I thought that many people may be interested in whether this battery was recoverable or not, because I wasn't sure, and I was just using it as a demonstration. So I'm going to update you on the status of it. My charger's over here. This is the old charger that I used for uh, the entire reconditioning process thus far. Now I have to admit I didn't exactly follow the procedure that I had outlined in my previous video. I did remove this resistor for a while, for a few days, to speed up the process. This charger outputs somewhere around 16 volts open circuit, and the more current you draw, the more that voltage drops. So with it connected directly up to the battery, it sped up the process quite a bit and uh, once it started passing sufficient current then I put the resistor back in. But this battery is a little bit different than many others and it yielded some interesting results. So this is a 12 volt battery just like most and that means that it has six cells and most batteries the plates are arranged this way lengthwise along the battery they're all set up in parallel and you have one terminal on this end and one terminal on this end. This one has both terminals here, so they arrange the plates a little bit differently. Instead of having one, two, three, four, five, six cells, this one has three on each side. <clears throat> so the current goes around in a loop, and you end up with your positive and negative terminals here. And the reason that's interesting is because you can easily tell what's going on inside the batteries this way. The plates are positioned this way instead of this way, and that means that there's a lot of surface area for each of the six cells, three on this side, three on this side. And you can really tell what is going on inside the battery that way. You can put your ear up to it and listen to how much it's outgassing in each cell. And you can also uh, feel them or use an infrared thermometer uh, to see which ones are getting warm and which ones aren't. And it was pretty interesting on this battery. Initially I had shown that with the res this resistor in the setup it was taking almost zero current, passing almost zero current, which is normal for a heavily sulfated battery. And after the first day, it was taking about 15 milliamps. The second day, it bumped up to 25 milliamps. And uh, a few days later, it finally uh, kind of broke loose and the current increased. Uh, at this point, I didn't have the resistor in because I was getting impatient. So um, I would recommend keeping it in. But if you're impatient like me, you can remove it. And it did go up to, uh, it crept up to around 3 amps in total. Uh, and then started dropping back down. At the point it started dropping back down, it outgassed quite a bit, so I put the resistor back in for the next few days until the current stabilized at uh, about uh, 400 milliamps. And that's where it stayed, so I disconnected it. Overall, the process took about one week to restore this battery, at least through that many steps. I still have to do the cycling steps, so I don't know if this battery works. But I thought it was interesting that the middle cell on this side, once it started passing current, it got really quite hot, just right down here at the bottom. And as the next couple days progressed, this hot spot moved, and it kind of crept its way up the cell to the top. And then, after that, the cell was no longer hot anymore, and the hot spot moved over to the middle cell on this side. And it did a similar thing. It didn't get quite as warm, but eventually, by the time this battery had stabilized in its current, the current rose, and then it fell back down again, uh, then all of the cells seem to be gassing pretty evenly, and there's no temperature differential between them anymore. So, it's kind of interesting that the, uh, the sulfation in here, apparently this battery had two bad cells. Uh, the sulfation yields a, a high resistance in that particular cell, so when you try to pass current through it, it gets pretty hot. Um, I also suspected that there were some reverse formation issues in this battery. A lot of those are non-recoverable, so we'll see if this works or not. But I thought it was pretty interesting uh, that I was able to monitor what was going on and how many cells were bad in here. But I have the setup here, and I was using this meter in my previous video, but I do know that this meter is about 0.1 volts off. So for the real test, I'm going to be using this one. Now this battery has been sitting open circuit for almost a day, and you can see that it's holding at 13 volts, which is very, very good. So the next step, as I outlined, was to discharge the battery down to 11 volts as measured at the battery terminals. So I have these test leads clipped right on so I can monitor it with my multimeter here. 
and uh, put a 20 amp load on it and time it. So that's what I'm going to do right now. And I haven't tried this yet, so I'm going to turn this inverter on, which is plugged into this light bar. I don't know how many lights are on at the moment, but we'll find out. And then I'm going to time it. So we'll find out right here if the inverter actually can be powered by this battery or not. Uh, but before I do, I want to mention that initially this battery was so dead that I couldn't even turn the inverter on with no load. Um, yeah, you, you got nothing. When you tried to charge it, you got 10 milliamps, and I bet when you tried to discharge it, you also got about 10 milliamps maximum when you shorted the battery. It was completely dead. So this is a good example of restoring an extremely sulfated battery. Like I said, this battery had been stored unused and uncharged for four years. So if this one's recoverable, you can bet a lot of them are. But before I talk too much about it, let's turn this on and see what happens. So I do have two lights on over here. Hard to see on camera, but there's just two light bulbs on. I'm going to start my stopwatch. Okay, that started. And let's see what the voltage does. This meter has some smoothing on it, so I'm going to turn it on and off of DC voltage. And the voltage is dropping quite a bit. Um, I don't like seeing that. It should be a little bit more steady. But a lot of times what you'll see in a battery like this, after it's been floated for a long time, the voltage will sag down, and then after a few minutes it'll start recovering again. And there's technical reasons why that happens. There's white papers available on the internet uh, that you can read, for, read about that particular effect. But in any case, I'm going to let this inverter run for however long it runs until it's at 11 volts. And I'm going to update you on what it does during its very first cycle. There are many more cycles to come, I am sure, to get this thing fully restored. But uh, I just thought some of you would be interested to see how this really turns out. Now, to recharge the battery after it goes through this first cycle, I'm not using this charger. That would be really slow. I'm going to use something different. But that's kind of beside the point right now. I'm going to turn the camera off, and I'll just update you as this goes. We're about three minutes in, and the voltage has stabilized at, uh, well, at this, about 12.2 volts. And I really should be checking the current, so I'm going to grab my clamp meter, put it on here, and we're drawing... 18, 19 amps out of the battery. Now, as the battery voltage falls, this is going to increase at uh, pretty much a direct ratio of the battery voltage. So, this will go up over 20 amps by the time it's done discharging. On average, it's going to be about 20 amps. Uh, so, that's about what I wanted. I'll just use 20 amps for the amp hour figure by the time we're done, but it's holding steady. So, this battery is performing pretty well. Now, particularly on the first cycle, I want to keep track of the battery temperature and note if any of these cells get warmer than others, because if they do, that means that the internal resistance of those particular cells is higher than the rest, and that's not good. That means that I have more work to do, that I need to uh, put that equalizing or reformation charge on the battery for a longer period of time. But I did wait until the current had stabilized, and then waited another 48 hours, like I said, so I should not have that problem. All I should need to do now is cycle the battery. So, turn the camera off again here, and I'll update you again later. And the total runtime was just 31 minutes. So, not very long. A 20 amp load for half an hour, that means 10 amp hours. Not that great, considering it's a 100 amp hour battery. But this is just the first cycle, and this battery was severely, <clears throat> severely neglected, so I can't uh, be too disappointed. After all, the first cycle always is going to be short. Now, in terms of temperature on the battery, you can't see me feel the battery um, in terms of what temperature I feel with my hand, so I'm going to use this meter so you can actually see. Now, the whole battery on both sides is about 26 degrees Celsius. But this one cell here is about 28 degrees Celsius. So just this one cell, the one that had the biggest issue before, still has an issue. Its internal resistance is too high. And if you take a look at my voltmeter, you can directly see that the, volt, that the resistance of that cell is too high. I just turned the load off a minute or so ago, and the battery voltage is creeping up. You can see that the battery voltage here is 12.35 volts and increasing yet. Uh, if I let this sit overnight, it'll probably go back up to 12.7 or so after a while. 
And that's because this battery still has a significant amount of capacity remaining. The real issue here isn't that the battery is drained, it's that the internal resistance is high enough that it can no longer support a 20 amp load. So the internal resistance is high enough that it gets enough voltage drop, primarily in this one cell that got warm, that my voltage at the terminals is 11 volts. So we're probably getting a volt voltage drop or more just in that one cell, and that's not good. And that's why we have to cycle the battery. Get that hard sulfation layer that we weren't able to turn back into battery acid uh, to crack. We'll expand the plates and uh, crack that layer, uh, which we just did by discharging it. That's what makes them expand. When you recharge it, it shrinks again. Voltage is still going up. And uh, then we're going to be able to reform some of that lead once again into uh, uh, sulfuric acid, like it's supposed to be in this battery. Now this will never be 100% restored back to its original condition, but I have to say, 10 amp hour sure is a lot better than zero. And there really isn't any reason you couldn't put this battery back into service just like this in parallel with another one. It would help that battery out. It would increase your capacity. There's nothing wrong with doing that, but... So what I'm going to do here is cycle it and continue this process. And we're just going to keep updating this video here and see how much capacity that this completely dead battery that most people would have just turned into a recycler can give me. And to recharge the battery, I'm using my charger of choice that I use for just about everything anymore. My IOTA DLS45 with the IQ4 module. It is a pretty badass charger, I must say. And I put this meter on here, but I overheated it at one point, so it doesn't work very well anymore. Anyway, it's a 45 amp charger. However, my meter here says that it's only charging at a rate of 5 amps and falling. That's because the internal resistance of this thing is very high. It doesn't accept much charge yet. So, we're going to cycle it.